Here goes nothing. Welcome to Season 7, Episode 26 of the Ubuntu Podcast. In this episode, we'll have some interviews. Mark did at JISC, and we'll read your feedback. If you're listening live, you can send us the message using the chat thing on the website and in the UUPC IRC channel. I'm Alan, and joining me this week is Laura. Hello! <laughs> Oh, gosh. So for those of you who didn't know, last week we had some audio troubles. Uh, I think we fixed them now. Uh, well, more of a workaround than a fix. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We're now on a single microphone. <laughs> I think every week something else has gone wrong. So by the time Tony comes back, they'll, we'll be down to a single microphone and nothing. <laughs> All four of us sat around one microphone. <laughs> yeah. So what have you been up to, Laura? Um, I was, I, well, I went to a funeral, but my um, 11 year old cousin taught me how to use Instagram. <laughs> um, and she see, I had, I, yeah, I installed the app and let her set it up for me. And because I'd let her set it up for me, she seemed to think that meant that I didn't know how to use phones um, and kept saying things like, do you know how to direct message? <laughs> so I was like, yes. <laughs> so. so it- what, are you now on Instagram and now you're going to be posting loads of pictures of food and your trainers and bare feet in sand and stuff like that? No. Oh, I'm disappointed. <laughs> um, so what have you been up to? I've been using proprietary software this week. Ooh. Yes. Uh, so <laughs> uh, I've been using something called Construct2. It's a Windows uh, development tool for making uh, games mostly Uh, you can make apps with it but mostly people use it for making games i've been playing with it um because my kids want to make some games and they're kind of beyond using scratch now Uh, they want to make something that's um going to be usable on other platforms like their tablets and phones and desktops and something they can share with their friends so i had a look at this construct too and the cool thing about it is it's it's a kind of drag and drop and point and click uh developer tool it's really powerful and it spits out uh, HTML5, so you can the resulting code uses like WebGL and all the modern technologies, but it'll run inside a browser on anything, basically on phones, tablets, desktops. It's really really cool. Cool. Um, so I've started making silly little games, um, which I'm not very good at, and um, yeah, keep an eye out for my rubbish games that will be. Uh, in a, in a store near you soon perhaps if you're lucky um okay shall we uh listen to mark's interviews and have a cup of tea i think so Can you tell us a bit about the JISC Summer of Student Innovation? So the Summer of Student Innovation uh, is a competition that we've run now uh, the second year where we invite um, groups of students to pitch a project idea for how they'd like to improve student life, learning and teaching, research um, in any way they want using technology. So they, they pitch an idea um, on a website we call Disc Elevator where they do a two to three minute um, video presentation. Uh-huh. Uh, people then vote and they have to get a threshold number of votes to qualify. 250 votes from 10 institutions to qualify. Right. Um, so that selects them down and then we take the best around 20 of those projects, uh, give them £5,000 each and invite them along to a summer school where we do three times three days uh, working with them and supporting them with later. Cool. So you said this is the second year that you've done it. So what were uh, what what was your favourite project that came out of the first year of the programme? Oh, favourite project, that's a hard one. <laughs> um, one of the best projects that we've had was a project called Core for Participants, which was about supporting uh, participant research. Um, they, they're probably the most mature project. Mm-hmm. We've been working with them for the last 12 months um, to look at developing their website into a, a new service. And we'll hopefully give them a part of the support for them. So uh, a successful project as part of the, the summer schools can 
uh, actually become uh, a live service used by the UK education sector? Yes, that's what we're exploring. We're exploring different um, approaches for how we can make those services. So we can either integrate them into our, into our own portfolio within GISC, or we could support them in some other way, so we might just subscribe to them, service, pay for them, or, or we may just help them along their way to get some investor funding somewhere else, and become a, a big multi-million pound industry of their own. Uh-huh. Um, are there any particular themes you see a lot of projects um, working in similar areas? Um, yeah. I've got a presentation on this. <laughs> uh, there's been a lot of projects around sort of quantified self last year. Uh-huh. So there's a sort of, we want a, we want an app that will tell us how, how to do this better, how to study better, right. monitor my sort of studying skills type kind of stuff. Um, we've had quite a lot of projects this year around assessment, around multiple choice questions you saw, around different methods of learning and through assessment. Um, that's quite a strong theme this year. A lot of them are looking around social networking things, so mm-hmm. you like uh, an educational version of um, Facebook, yep. something a bit more specific. Uh, and then some of them are very student life based. Uh, and they're just about improving the students' learning experience. So it's not necessarily um, about the actual study. Uh, study life is also about the social aspect of so student life as well. Any, any project that's around either supporting learning and teaching or supporting research, oh, right, or yep. it can be around the student life experience. So we've got one project this year that's about um, promoting the um, promoting women in the workplace, right? To give them a positive image in science and technology areas. So that's what delivering examples to students of where they can progress from their degree into yeah, sort of, industry. Yes, delivering examples of successful women yeah. in, in career pathways, particularly in science and technology. Because um, we have found that the the projects are dominantly male-led. Right. Which is, I think, partly a result of the sort of technology subject area. Right. Yeah. Um, Technology and business. Not all. We do. We do have some. We're very successful. Cool. Okay. Uh, Well, hopefully, I'll get a chance to speak to some of the the projects later. If people want to know more about the Summer of Student Innovation, uh, where can they go to find out more? You have to give me the web address, right? Yep. That sounds. That's usually what people do. Is the the Gisk Elevator site a good place to start? If they look for, um, go to the GISC website and look for student innovation. Right, so that's gisc.ac.uk. gisc.ac.uk slash student innovation. Excellent. Thanks very much. I'm at the GISC Summer of Student Innovation Summer School, and I'm talking to Joel Murphy from the Unisaver Project. Hello, Joel. How are you doing? Hi, mate. I'm good, thanks. Uh, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Um, so, <laughs> do you want to start off just by telling us a bit about what Unisaver is? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, Unisaver is an um, online community mm-hmm. uh, for students, uh, all aimed at saving money. So how does Unisaver try and save students money, and what sort of thing are they saving money on? Um, so, well, obviously, like I said, it's an online community. Yep. So um, students themselves would uh, post content to my website. Yep. And obviously, they could vote on the best deals. Right. And if they find a better deal, they could resubmit that deal for the product that's been submitted, mm-hmm. and that would show a new deal for that product. Um, the type of products they're posted, obviously, um, so anything a student would use in their everyday life, uh-huh. anything from uh, university equipment or you know, college equipment, such as pencils, notepads, um, yeah, things like that, and also uh, food and drink. You know, right. Food and drink. Yeah. Um, so say, for example, you know, you're having a party, um, you know, you want to make the most of that party, you want to make it as cheap as possible. Yep. <laughs> take advantage of uh, student discounts and yep. buy in bulk. And that's exactly what the website aims for. Okay. To give the best the pointing out the, de- the deals and yeah, where you get student discount as well and where yeah, it's going to exactly. be cheapest. Right, okay. So um, what, are you, uh, what are you doing with Unisaver as part of the summer school? 
Um, so yeah, obviously uh, the project's been funded. Yeah. Um, they just helped me develop the idea to make it you know more of a success. Mm -hmm. You know, just aim you know a better product towards students really. Right. So uh, what what sort of um, what sort of what sort of things you are you trying to do to Unisaver to make it more useful for students? Um, enhance the product, you know, make sure it suits the needs yeah. of, of the target audience. Right, so you're trying to identify exactly how it is yeah, that, yeah, that, yeah. Um, that students will want to use it so that you can then improve it. Yeah. Right, yeah. cool. Okay, uh, and is, this, is the, the site live at the moment? Can people go and check it out? Um, there is a website. Right. But it's not ready. Yet. Okay then. Well, I'll, we won't give out the URL. Very, very, very early alpha stages. Okay. But yeah, definitely. Well, I, I can give out the URL now. You know, this. Yeah. You know, there's nothing on the record screen. Okay then. So um, yeah, the, uh, the URL is uh, unisaver.co.uk. Yep. Dot com as well. So that uh, should be set in. Okay. So can people go there and, and submit their tips at the moment? Uh, not at the moment. Right. <laughs> but hopefully uh, over the next few months, as you uh, yeah. as you course, develop yeah, as part definitely. of the the summer of student innovation excellent okay well thanks very much thank you very much i'm at the jisc summer of student innovation summer school and i'm talking to joseph MacArthur from the open access button hi joe hi uh, so to start with for those who might not be familiar with the term what is open access uh, open access is an alternative to the traditional publishing system. The traditional publishing system, that's a mouthful, <laughs> the event name, um, uh, has a tendency to lock information up behind paywalls, behind uh, barriers which stop people accessing it. Open access is the alternative to that. It's uh, free, immediate online access to scholarly articles um, with full of reuse rights. Right, so we're talking about academic publishing and academic journals. Yeah, uh, the Times won't be open access, but your, 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 uh, yeah, your journal for science or um, might be. Right, OK, so how, um, how does getting access to an open access um, paper work differently to getting access to one through traditional methods? So traditional methods would normally involve you paying in some way for that article. You may see that you pay or, or you may not. So if you're a big institution like a university, maybe a, a company, they may buy on your behalf um, a subscription to lots and lots of journals and they'll, they'll spend uh, thousands, hundreds of thousands, sometimes millions of pounds doing that so that when you're on their networks you don't notice that um, that all of this this research has a real cost associated with it and um, if you don't have one of those uh, institutions backing you then you'll be asked to pay 20 30 dollars pounds uh, per article um, just to read it sometimes for as little as 24 hours uh, this, uh, as you can imagine is not something that a lot of people can afford and even big universities struggle to afford all of these subscriptions to the tens of thousands of journals there are mm -hmm. the difference with open access is that uh, it's funded in a different way but it allows for anyone to access that research for free which right is really important. so is the money which you're paying to access the articles not funding the research so by taking that away you would be making the research harder to uh, to fund um in some senses, uh, I think it's probably also important to recognise that uh, all of that money that is spent by subscriptions yep. is also taken out of uh, research budgets. Uh, right, the so the, that, it's money which the universities would otherwise be able to spend themselves on research. Yes, yeah, so right. It's, so, so it's probably worth just going over how open access is funded. So um, yep. about 70% of journals are funded, uh, are free to publish in, they're funded by... Uh, by sponsorship and by advertisements, just like everything else on the internet, essentially. Yep. The other 30%, um, you pay what's called uh, APCs, article processing charges, which can vary from a few dollars to uh, a few thousand dollars, depending on the journal and the model that they, that they have taken. Um, that money is normally paid by research funders, and often, especially in the UK, uh, research funders like the Wellcome Trust and uh, I think RC UK are now putting pots of money aside that aren't linked really directly to a research budget. It's uh -huh. a budget to publish. Right. Um, and the important thing is you do that just once. Mm -hmm. You then no longer have to pay for that for the rest of uh, human time. Right. Cool. Okay, so that's a bit about what open access is. What's the open access button? Uh, the open access button is a tool that helps track when people are denied access to research right. and also works to get people access to that research about... 
18 months ago now, me and my friend were doing research um, at uh, for Big Pharma and also at university, and we couldn't get access to the research that we needed, and we were really frustrated. Um, and we were lucky enough then to discover open access, and when we found out about this idea and about how it was kind of starting to become really mainstream and it was proven that, that open access was a viable way of doing scholarly publishing, uh, we, were, we were basically really pissed off mm -hmm. that, 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 you know, traditional publishing was kind of still being st still a thing and we decided that uh, we came up with this idea of trying to gather those moments of frustration when you hit a paywall, when you're denied access to research yeah. and gathering those up so that everyone could see them. Um, and that those those moments of frustration could lead to something much more positive yeah. than than just going off and being a bit annoyed that you'd spent half an hour searching for something and you, you no longer could. So we uh, we worked with volunteer developers from around the world to to build this tool, um, and we launched it in November to um, to thousands to, who are now thousands of users who are busy collecting their stories of, uh, of, of being done out access to research and we've now got about 8,000 of those and it makes a really strong case. Cool, so um, <clears throat> so what's, what's the most sort of interesting or surprising thing that you found out from these stories? Oh, how long do we have? <laughs> I mean, it's been, it's a really good question, like I think just the range uh -huh. of, of, of stories that, that's out there. Um, I guess for us, when we when we first launched it, we expected to see uh, patients in there who were trying to find out uh, about their conditions. We expected to see doctors and researchers who couldn't access um, access the research they needed. What we didn't expect was uh, school children trying to do trying to do their homework. Wow. Right? Okay. Like we, you know. We didn't expect uh, the, the, the. I don't think we expected the quantity. Yeah. The tool to be taken up quite so heavily. That I think it was clear that people were really interested in being able to share their stories about this. And in just the way the tool worked, we didn't expect for stories to build quite so naturally. We we, we have users who use it a lot, um, and you see that one one of the clearest cases is this is a patient who's clearly you know, trying to find out about their condition, about the drugs they're taking, about, yep. you know, alternatives and the side effects that are, they're having. And that just builds up a really strong image of, you know, yes, you might hit a paywall once, and that's that's troublesome and annoying, but what happens when you hit one ten times, yep. right? Um, and what's the real impact of that to a, a patient's health, to a researcher's, you know, studies, or, or to a school person doing their doing their homework and mm. I think we've just been able to show that in a way which was completely uh, impossible before yeah. in cool. a really organic way it's yeah. someone sitting down to tell us a story it's little moments mm -hmm. right, and they're creating something more powerful cool okay so if people wanted to uh, get involved in the open access button project are you looking for developers or um, are you looking for people to contribute in other ways to the project? Yeah, so um, we've got the Open Access Button site, uh, which is very Googleable, and um, the openaccessbutton.org, uh, where you can go and start to just take part in actually logging paywalls and um, really, uh, you know, just using it as part of your research. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, we are, this research, th th this project has been done almost entirely off of volunteer development time, and we're still looking for that. Um, we're looking to start a new kind of development cycle in the next uh, month or so where we'll, be, where we'll be looking for volunteer developers. You can go to blogs.openaccessbutton.org um, to find more information on that and how you can get involved. Um, and yeah, I mean, any support is really, really useful. It's all done off volunteer time. Uh, if you can donate, that's also really, really useful, or just connect us with people. It's really been a, a team effort from, from a small community of, of people uh, doing some really spectacular things. Cool. Well, I hope it goes well in the future. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Mark. And now, oh, with a microphone that works, it's time for command line love. Doesn't sound sexy when I do it, does it? <laughs> you need a deeper voice. <laughs> Admittedly, I don't think it sounds sexy when Mark does it either. <laughs> so, yeah, there you go. I'm not into that kind of thing. If you are, fair enough. Write in and tell us. <laughs> yes. 
or don't. Uh, so Command Line Love was submitted uh, by email from Waldemir Kabbalah, which is a fabulous name. I hope I didn't murder that too much. And it's actually one that I've seen a couple of times. And someone else posted on Twitter in a random conversation. I saw it. And it's brilliant. Mm-hmm. It um, does what? It's for spinning up a web server on your machine. Let's say, for example, you want to transfer a file or you want to open a file that's on your laptop and you want to open it on your tablet or you're, you're on your Linux machine and you need to transfer a file to someone who's on Windows or yeah. but they're on your network. Mm-hmm. You know, so you're at work or you're at home and you've got two people on the same network. It's a really quick way to transfer files from one place to another by just spinning up a web server. And it's just Python using a module, um, which depending upon whether you're running Python 2 or Python 3, there's two different commands. On Python 2, it's Python minus M and then simple HTTP server. And that runs a web server in whatever directory you're currently in. So if you're sat in the directory with whatever files you want to share, you run this command and it starts a web server. So then the other machine, you just open your web browser and point it at the machine that's running the web server. And you just get a directory listing of everything that's in that directory. Hmm. And then you can download stuff. So it's real quick and easy because like every machine's got a web browser. Yes. Yeah. And most machines have Python. So it's very quick and easy. You just run Python with this command and bam, you've got a web server. Quick and easy way to transfer files. Neat. Mm, very. Thank you very much for that, uh, Waldemar. And now it's time for some feedback. Uh, first of all, we have an email from Daniel Alexanderson. I think that's right. Mm-hmm. He says, love the show. Oh, thank you. He says, <laughs> <laughs> I normally edit those bits out. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we don't relish too much in uh, the compliments. Uh, few and far between as they are. Uh, he says, I am curious, though, what operating systems and players do your listeners use to listen to the show? Could you please share some general numbers on what pod fetches are popular and what share of the audience choose OG over MP3? Well, Tony knows the OG versus MP3 numbers and doesn't tell us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know them too. He has a stats page somewhere, doesn't he? Yeah, I, I know that stats page. Um, oh. In general, I think it's um, it used to be that we would get the vast majority of our listeners from iTunes. Yes. So the MP3 feed gathered way more listeners. We haven't looked at those stats for a long time. Um, they are generated and we could, and Tony every so often generates a nice graph. <laughs> Tony likes graphs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, we haven't done it for a while and, um, it, it's interesting because we did a bunch of years where we did one episode every two weeks. It yes. was an hour long. Remember those times? Remember when we used to yeah. do that? Gosh. Remember when we recorded on a Sunday and then edited it and put it out like a week later? A week later. <laughs> Cause it took that long to edit it. <laughs> Whereas now, it's just like, you know. Two evenings, it's done. Yeah, bam, bam. Job, done. <laughs> uh, so, and now we do them every week. We put them out every week. Yes. And that's changed things a little bit in in the way that, you know, everyone gets the episode on the day one and then there's a long tail of people getting the episode later. Yeah. We get like the double bump because people download the episode every week instead of every, one big bump every two weeks. Yeah. Um, but no, we, we don't really keep an eye on that kind of stuff. We know, Tony does. Yeah, we know it's about 5,000 per episode or yeah. thereabouts. Um, but it varies over time as well because people still keep downloading it Yeah. afterwards. So it does got quite high, the older ones. Yeah, we got a, we got an email from someone who wanted to download the entire archive. Yes. What was that for? Oh, uh, it, it was someone at work wanted to download the entire back catalogue because they'd come to it partway through and they just, in a kind of pedantic way, wanted to go back to the beginning and start from the beginning. <laughs> Um, and he was trying to work out all kinds of scripts, trying to make it happen. And it was all based on the numbers of the episodes. But the problem is we use a different number of episodes every time. Right. Just because of how the weeks work out. And because then we changed it to two episodes. So the numbers suddenly shut up and yeah, it wasn't working. So you came up with a really simple command. <laughs> One line. <laughs> like, was it W get? Yeah. W, w get minus M. <laughs> Unfortunately, by the time I told him <laughs> the night, the night before I told him he'd managed to get his script working. Oh. No. I felt really bad. He says, yeah, that would have worked really well. <laughs> and that would have nicely bumped all our stats. Mm. <laughs> Although evenly for every single episode, yeah, to be fair. Yeah, that's true. 
So, uh, yes. And uh, Daniel also mentioned a cool new pod fetcher project for the Linux desktop. I have seen this before. It's very cool. It's by Nathan Dyer, and it's called Vocal. Uh, and he mentioned that as a possible uh, pod catcher that people might want to use. It's very nice. It's focused on uh, clean design, and it's uh, aimed at the um, elementary desktop. Very nice. Mm-hmm. Moving on. Uh, somebody. <laughs> I didn't put the name in. Oh, dear. <laughs> okay, well, I'll read it and you find the person's name. Oh, okay. So, somebody in uh, said that in uh, Season 7, Episode 22, the command line love, we mentioned SSH minus capital D. Um, something to do with VPN proxy? Yes, it was to, um, it's a poor man's proxy to, to get you um, to bypass filters that might be on your connection, that kind of thing. Okay. And um, yeah, it was a, it's a quick and easy way uh, to, do, to implement one of those, yes. Okay. And they said you only need root access on your local machine. Well, they're giving another option, aren't oh, they? Oh, I see, yes. Uh, this is... S-Shuttle? Uh, yes, S-Shuttle. Which apparently is in the repo. Huh. And that's even easier, apparently. You don't need to set up any proxy in your browser and all your outgoing traffic for the entire computer goes out of your SSH server. That's even better. Oh. That's that's much better because that way it's like near zero effort. You just run this command <laughs> and you don't have to... Because the, one of the problems with the SSH minus D is you run that to set up the tunnel and then you have to tell your browser, right, now send all the traffic through that tunnel. Right, yes. Which, if you've already got a browser open and you've already got loads of other apps open and you want all of your app traffic to go out through that connection. So, for example, if you're if you're torrenting, for example, not only do you want the browser to go out through that, that tunnel so that you pop up somewhere else or and see, you know, different results mm. because you're coming from somewhere else, um, but also you want the torrent traffic potentially to go out through that tunnel as well, maybe. But, um, yeah, and this I found the email and it was from Emilian Klein. Mm-hmm. And he says, yes, you do have a Frenchman listening to your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was another one. Oh, right. Oh, no, no. no. This is all the same email. This is all it? the same email. It's on oh, the same right. box. Yes, you're right. yes, it is. You do have a Frenchman listening to podcasts. So we know uh, whose name that was. We now. do love listening, finding out where people are oh, listening yeah. from. That's brilliant. Especially yeah. we've had some very obscure, like little tiny I, islands I in the middle. they're of not the... obscure to the people who live there. <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> one was, I think one was a tiny island in the middle of the Pacific or something. Oh, really? That was good. They wrote in. I can't remember. Yeah, it was very... Yeah. Maybe we should, when we look at our stats next, is have a look at, see the GOIP yes. lookup. I know it's not 100% reliable, but, but have a look and, uh, you know, spy on our listeners and... <laughs> no, I meant find out where they live. No, I mean, <laughs> get, I mean, mean... <laughs> get, get aggregated statistics for where they live. And we don't know anything like about your details. No, we don't want to know. No. Unless you tell us, in which case we love to know. Yes. Yes, that would be cool. <laughs> I think that's all of your feedback. We did have another feedback about oh, the sound we? quality. Oh, Yes. Yeah. Was that Ken? Ken? I don't know. I can't no, remember. I don't know. I uh, d- I I'm just doing that from memory. Uh, emailed us about the sound quality. Uh, it, it was a few episodes ago, but I suspect it was probably like the first one I did, mm-hmm. and it was all a bit quiet. Mm. So this week notwithstanding. <laughs> I mean, you mean last week? <laughs> last week, this week. <laughs> it's all a blur. Yeah. So 22 and 23, I think, were the last one. No, 23 and 24. What are we on? 25 and 26. Yeah, so 20, 23 and 24, I actually normalised all the sounds. So I'd be quite interested to know whether you think that was any better. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to do the same today, you, hopefully. You, you got out your um, girl's big book of uh, audacity. Audacity, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks, O'Reilly. Excellent. Well, that's all your feedback. The Ubuntu podcast needs you. Yes, you. If you hear something that enthralls, exasperates or elevates you, Tweet at UUPC or email podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. You can also talk to us on the telephone, Skype, Facebook and Google+. Find links to all these places on our website, podcast.ubuntu-uk.org. Please do get in touch. I mean it. Just one message. Just to know there's someone out there who cares. And that's it for today. The next live show will be on Wednesday, the 1st of October at half past eight. In the evening. And not uh, 2030 UTC, as Mark tweeted from our account earlier today. Silly oh, yes. boy. Silly boy. Yeah. But we do get that wrong every time. So <laughs> it's, fine. it's either him getting it wrong or one of us getting it wrong. Or Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. And I was going to say that by this time, by 
next week we'll know whether the Ubuntu UK podcast is a little bit smaller. Oh, yeah, smaller um, demographic. Yeah. yeah, for the UK. But actually, for this show, we should already know. Yes. Because this is next week. Well, we already know, and the answer, well, yes, surprised us. Surprised us. <laughs>